Hey guys, good morning. Um, starting, I guess today will be Wednesday for you guys. Um, looking at the review guide today, it looks like we have a whole lot of notes. Um, I promise it shouldn't take like too terribly long though. It's just a lot because we're gonna be covering a couple different pocket pet breeds. Um, last class we had so many rabbits to go over that we just did like one lesson on rabbits. Today we're going to go over hamsters, gerbils, mice, and rats, I think. Um, so a couple different ones, and then y'all are going to be starting your pocket pet diagnosis and treatment assignment. You're not necessarily going to be finishing it because some of the answers are going to be covered, I think, on the next lesson. So moving to the PowerPoint. Um, like I said, it seems like a lot. It's not going to be too terrible, though. Um, so the first thing is that pocket pets, which are tiny pets, not necessarily tiny, but they're named because they could potentially fit in your pocket. Some of them you're going to need, like, a really big pocket, like a hoodie pocket. But, um gerbils, hamsters, mice, rats, ferrets, chinchillas. Mm, I feel like I'm forgetting one more. Rabbits are not considered to be a pocket pet. Um, just because of how big they're, some of the breeds get, um, you can't say that half of them are pocket pets and the other half of them are not. So rabbits aren't included in the pocket pets category, but they are in this PowerPoint. Um, so just know pocket pets, tiny pets, not rabbits though. Pocket pets are not defined really so much by breeds as they are grouped based on their colors. Um, a lot of them, they're going to be named after whatever color they are. You've got tans, you've got self-colored, you've got satins, which satins refer to, um, I think we're going to get to it today. It's the brie, it's a brie where like they have a really shiny hair coat. So they're called satins. Um, so you're not really gonna see a whole lot like with, when we talk about the rabbits or dogs or you've got like the Flemish giant, you've got the New Zealand white, you've got the Labrador retriever, the Chihuahua, like you don't have necessarily breeds. They're more so grouped together based on what color they are. So the first one, sticking with the colors is the golden hamster um golden hamster they're super common as pets um they're not really big but that's great and because hamsters aren't super big um the golden hamster is noted for its golden color um and then it does have a whiter a little bit of white on its belly and you may see a little black, you can't see it on this one, but you, some of them may have a black patch, almost kind of like a, a big freckle um, on their cheeks. Um, when we talk about like the patch on their cheek, it always reminds me of like Pikachu for whatever reason. Um, next one up is you can, this one can be called either the long haired hamster or the teddy bear hamster. Um, they're called the teddy bear hamster because they look like really soft and cute and cuddly and that's because they have this like really long silky hair. Then you got the dwarf or the small desert hamster. Um, this hamster is a darker color um, and it does have like a little strip or stripe running down its back. Uh, it's going to be smaller than the golden hamster and not not by like a ton probably not in our standards but comparatively to hamsters the dwarf or the small hamster is going to be smaller because dwarf that's what it means it kind of has to be smaller than the other ones but they're still really active um but because because hamsters in general are so small they don't necessarily make the best pets for children um it's, they're very tiny, and children, as much as we all love them, they don't have the best motor skills, meaning being able to, like, grab things. I'm sure, positive, 
that there's been cases where kids go to pick up a hamster and they accidentally like squeeze it to death because they they don't realize how strong they are like when a little kid hits you it hurts so they don't realize how strong they are hamsters don't really make the best pets because if you're going to give them a pet they're going to want to hold it they're going to want to play with it they're going to want to touch it and they're so small that they're very, they're pretty likely to be to be getting hurt um diseases affecting a hamster um i wish this would load i'll close it and maybe it'll fix itself um this picture up here it got posted i don't even know where it got posted i think i saw it on twitter and i just i loved it um it's a text message chain of someone texting their friend obviously with an android but i guess we won't talk about that um so they're talking about their sister who's a vet student and she said that this little girl brought in her pet hamster and because they were concerned it hadn't eaten for three days it just wants to like sit on the side of the cage it won't eat or drink anything three days is a long time to go without eating or drinking anything especially when you consider how little tiny these hamsters are um so the vet student asked like if anything had happened like why something that might have caused it and she said that the hamster escaped for a while but they found him under the fridge mm. trying to get a hamster out from under the fridge sounds impossible so they took the hamster and they put him on the table and they look around like see if he like here's a little bit of food here's some water like let's see what happens and the hamster ended up eating and drinking which you know makes a lot of sense because it's been three days but it's weird because it has been doing that at home um then they look and a hamster is known for having these like chubby cheeks to be able to kind of store food and they see his cheeks are kind of chubby and they look inside and they found a magnet in this hamster's mouth so the only thing that was wrong with the hamster was that because it had a magnet in its cheek it was literally stuck to the side of the cage it couldn't get to the food or water because it it wanted to keep this magnet in its mouth and it got stuck to the point that it just like it couldn't move itself so i love that story i just think it's really funny um getting on to actual diseases that hamsters can get first one is wet tail wet tail you can guess why its tail is wet um it's also known as enteritis meaning inflammation of the intestines which you can also guess what that means um yes very bad diarrhea very bad like so bad to the point that the animal the diarrhea is so bad that the animal is dehydrated and it's gonna it will likely end up dying if something isn't fixed um a lot of times it's it's associated with like poor sanitation with the cage not being kept clean the feeder the feed not being kept fresh the water not being changed out um so trying to do those things sanitation is very very important um so just making sure that the hamster's cage is clean to make sure that there isn't any like bacteria or anything that could try to lead to the infection um and inflammation or making sure that the food is fresh so that it's not eating food that's covered in pee and poop because that will absolutely mess your body system up next one is just common diarrhea I'm sensing a theme here um, common diarrhea it's typically gonna be caused by you not feeding your hamster properly and this can happen with like tons of pocket pets um, we get these cute little pocket pets and we just automatically think like oh they love fruits and vegetables i don't know where I, I guess it's just from tv that we get this idea that they love fruits and vegetables and don't get me wrong they do but no one ever tells you how bad it is for their diet the reason that they're fed commercial pellets is because these commercial pellets are a diet that's put up to make sure that they have all the right nutrients they're getting all their carbs and protein and fat and vitamin C. They're getting all of these things in their pellets. So that on, the only time they should get these leafy greens is going to be as a snack and it should be a little bit. Because too much of it, fruits and vegetables have a ton of water in them. 
so much to the point that the large intestine can't squeeze all that water out. So what ends up happening is because it can't squeeze the water out, you end up with some diarrhea. Um, so what you need to do is just if you get a pocket pet, a guinea pig, get that, I was forgetting a guinea pig, um, guinea pig, hamster, gerbil, rat, mouse, like any of these animals, rabbits, rabbits are included in this warning too. Um, fruits and vegetables should be given as like small snacks because too much of it will end up leading to them getting diarrhea. There's a reason that we feed them commercial pellets. That's because all of their needs are being met through those pellets. So hamster uses, um, they've been used in medical research since like the 1930s, um, where people found that like they're actually, they're pretty cute and they make a pretty good pet. Um, the golden hamster is the most common one just because it's like these chubby cheeks. It's a cute little color. Um, so they're really popular for being used as pets. And again, the dwarf or small hamster makes good pets, but I say that this warning goes to all hamsters. I don't think a kid like under the age of 10 should have a hamster as a pet because they, even at 10, they don't even know how strong they are. And snatching that hamster up too quickly can end up like really hurting it. So housing for hamsters, um, they don't need like a huge cage, something like a foot long, a foot and a half almost tall, and then or a foot tall and then a foot and a half wide. You just want them to have enough room to be able to move around, some room to climb. You need to make sure that the cage is gnaw proof because pocket pets, their teeth continue growing, meaning they're gonna chew on everything that they can. This hamster here is gonna chew on its water bottle, his wheel, his cage, his food bowl, the little tunnel here. Like he's gonna chew on everything because that's what pocket pets do. So the cage needs to be gnaw proof so that if and when they decide to do that, they're not gonna be able to easily bite through and escape. Um, stainless steel cages are good cages to keep them in. The water bottle needs to hang outside because if your hamster decides to start gnawing on this water bottle, all of a sudden you have a water bottle that cannot hold water. So the water bottle should be kept outside of the cage so they can't end up gnawing on it. Um, aquariums make really good cages to keep pocket pets in because it's easy to clean. You can see everything through. They can't like chew through it. Um, so aquariums, they make pretty good cages for the animals. Um, exercise wheels, hamsters do love and want and probably need an exercise wheel. Um, you can do plastic or metal. Plastic is quieter, but it's not gonna last as long because the animal's gonna be able to chew on it. Whereas metal wheels are gonna last longer, but they're gonna be louder. And hamsters and a lot of pocket pets are nocturnal. You're gonna hear them. So if you get yourself a hamster and you get them a metal wheel, you're gonna you're gonna hear them running at night. Um, so it's just it's a trade-off. Do you want something quiet that's not gonna last long, or do you want something loud that's gonna last a while? Um, hamsters need a lot of fresh bedding uh, because they do they like to chew on it. It sounds kind of gross because that's also where they go to the bathroom, but it happens. There's, an, there's nothing you can do. Um, it's something natural and a lot of pocket pets will end up doing it. You can use um, paper like we use at school, wood chips or shavings, hay, straw, cotton. Um, you just want to be careful that what you're, whatever you're using as bedding, like I would be hesitant to use the cotton as bedding because if they're chewing on that, that cotton is going to absorb when it meets liquid. And if it eats it, it can end up getting stuck in their digestive system. So I would be hesitant at something like that. When it comes to feeding your hamster, commercial pellets. Commercial pellets are what you go to the store and you buy. It says hamster feed, and that's what you feed your hamster. Um, if you want to make your own, it should include things like seeds, a little bit of lettuce, because lettuce is basically like pure water. It's green solidified water, basically. So not a ton of lettuce, but a little bit. You can feed them dried peas, beans, um, nuts. Um, you don't want to suddenly change your diet. And this goes for just about any animal. 
you don't want to suddenly change their diet because their body is used to digesting this one food and then you give them something completely different and their body's like, oh, I don't feel so good. You don't want to leave any soft foods in the cage to spoil. So this can be like fruits and vegetables typically um, because it's going to end up going bad and it can end up getting stuck in their little cheeks. Think about that magnet. Excuse me, special treats and foods. Some... Oh my goodness, include sunflower seeds. Um, I don't know if y'all are old enough to remember, but when I was growing up, there was a show called Hamtaro, and it came on like Cartoon Network or something, and it was this hamster and all of her friends, they would like escape their cages, and they would all hang out, um, and their favorite treats were sunflowers. Like, I don't know why I remember this, but I do. They also really like crickets and grasshoppers. I would probably give them the like, little dead dried up ones, because I don't want those things to escape. If you have a wire cage and you put crickets and grasshoppers in there, you're gonna have crickets and grasshoppers in your house because they're gonna slide right on through. So I'll recommend giving them already dead ones. Gerbils, um, gerbils are longer. They're honestly, they're a little bit skinnier than hamsters, but they're longer because of their tail. Um, they still weigh about the same, maybe a little bit less. And the first breed of gerbil is the Mongolian gerbil. And the Mongolian gerbil, they're literally, they're based on their colors. So the Mongolian gerbil is this like reddish brown to dark brown color. Basically, a brown gerbil. And that's really the only one that we're going to go over. Um, diseases that gerbils can get. Colds are really common in pocket pets because they're very, very sensitive to their temperature and the ventilation around them. Um, so putting them next to like an air vent that's going off and cutting on, um, putting them next to a window where it's going to get really hot and it's going to cool off when the sun sets. You want to make sure that their environment is something stable or they'll end up getting a cold. So you're gonna see a loss of appetite. They're not really hungry because they don't feel great. Sneezing, um, runny nose, goo in their eyes. It can also be brought on by stress. And typically for animals, that's gonna, it can be caused by overcrowding. Putting too many gerbils in a cage where they're gonna have to try to kind of fight for territory. That's stressful. So they can end up getting sick. They can also get red nose, which is, Relatively common, it's caused by the Staphylococcus bacteria. So like staph, that's the same bacteria as when you get a staph infection. Um, it's also brought on by the same things. You're gonna see hair loss um, and then like a red swollen area around the muzzle or their nose, hence red nose. The animal will recover. You just wanna remove any of the things that caused it overcrowding, high humidity, um, horse bedding, where they're like sitting here and they're trying to snack on it and they're like rubbing their little nose raw. Because again, if they're eating their bedding, like they probably are, they're also gonna be peeing and pooping on it. You don't want their face to get rubbed raw while they're eating this bedding and then gonna rub some poopy or pee covered bedding all over their face. Sounds like a good way to get an infection. Um, gerbil uses, they were also used for research, um, popularized by Japanese scientists. Then they realized again, like how easy they are to work with. They're pretty gentle and compared to other animals, they're pretty active during the day, meaning you can do your research during the day and you can see how it affects them. You don't have to wait for them to like really wake up at night. Um, they don't have any really special food or housing requirements. They don't drink a ton of water. They don't smell too bad. And they seldom bite if they're handled. I had gerbils growing up. Me and my sister did. I hated them. I hated them because I didn't take very good care of them. Because I didn't realize how much they needed to be handled in order to be tamed. These things chewed out of their cages like every week. They escaped. We had to catch them. And when you went to go pick them up, because they were out and escaped so much, they were like almost wild. So when you went to go pick them up, their reaction when something in the wild picks them up is to bite them. So 
my sister got bit quite a few times by these gerbils. So they do, they require a lot of handling. Their tail is really sensitive. You want to watch out for that. Um, they need a little bit more space than hamsters because they are, they're much more active than hamsters. Um, and they are very territorial. So overcrowding with gerbils can end up leading to them fighting, killing, and quite possibly eating each other. And they can also jump. Um, the thing about gerbils, they can jump like two feet in the air. Like they might only be this big, they can jump. Um, those little back legs, they're like kangaroos, y'all. They have very powerful back legs. The only way that me and my sister caught our gerbils was we had to put like a 10 gallon bucket with a little bit of food downstairs because we knew they went from upstairs where we kept them to downstairs. And we had to put a little bit of food in that bucket and they could, for whatever reason, they could jump all the way in that bucket, but they couldn't jump out. So that was how we caught them every single time. Um, so making sure that the cage is covered, typically like a wire mesh is around the cage is going to be pretty important to making sure that they don't escape because they will. They're escape artists. They will escape. Um, you want to avoid like cotton and wool bedding, especially for gerbils because they're going to eat them and because they're so skinny, their digestive system isn't huge. So eating something that can absorb a lot of liquid will likely end up causing some kind of blockage. And that blockage can end up killing them if they're not able to pass it. They do, they chew a lot. Um, I would say comparatively, they're probably one of the like, they probably chew more than any of the other pocket pets. Um, so that means cheap toys are gonna be what keeps them busy. Cardboard tubes, like toilet paper tubes or paper towel tubes. Gerbils can run through them and they can gnaw on them and it works perfectly. Um, I mean, even our animals that we have at school, the guinea pigs and the rats especially, love to chew on toilet paper tubes. It's super easy, doesn't cost any money because let me tell you, you go to PetSmart, you're gonna pay a good like five, ten dollars for a little packet of toys that are gonna last them like a week. Give them a toilet paper tube, it lasts them not quite a week, and hey, you were going to throw it away anyways. You're out here saving money. Gerbils need solid wheels. Um, they don't need like the classic ones that go all the way around that have the little slots in them because of their little tail. Um, if their tail gets caught in one of the spokes, then it can end up getting caught, cut, it may need to be amputated. Um, so they need some kind of solid wheel. You can still get them like the classic circular wheel, but it can't have those spokes. It has to be completely solid all the way around so that their tail's not in danger. When you're feeding your gerbil. Um, you, again, commercial pellets, go to the store, buy them some gerbil food. The food should contain things like seeds, um, corn, maybe some oats, some wheat, some barley, um, just different field crops. You want to avoid sudden changes. You don't want to overfeed greens. They can also get wet tail. They can also get diarrhea from feeding them too many greens. Um, gerbils do also like bird seed, but bird seed is like really high in oil seed, like sunflower seeds. Um, that's why they're a treat. But if you feed them too much, it can end up leading to obesity and heart disease. So oil seeds like soybeans, peanuts, sunflower seeds, things like that, you want to limit to your animal because you don't want them to get obese. And then gerbils don't drink a lot of water. So moving on to rats, um, almost done. You, we have two that we're gonna go over, um, the black rat. It's this blackish color. Um, they're, the thing with the black rat is that their tail is going to be longer than their body. The tail is longer than their body. That's kind of how you're going to tell them apart from the brown rat. 
or the brown rat is larger than the black rat, but the tail is going to be shorter. If the tail is longer and it's a dark color, close to black, it's going to be a black rat. If the tail is shorter than the body and they're brown, then they're a brown rat. Um, so diseases that affect rats. Um, the first one, it's a respiratory disease, microplasma pulmonosis. Um, it's a, a relatively common disease, I guess. Common. Um, symptoms that you're going to see in your animal, nasal discharge, it's a respiratory disease. So you're going to see symptoms related to a respiratory disease. Runny nose, sniffling, um, rattle breathing. You're going to see them rubbing their eyes and their nose. And you may see them with their head tilted and seeming a little bit uncoordinated. Um, then the white rat is white albino rat, I guess I should say. Um, they've been really a big, big part of research in animals, um, whether it's medical, biological, or psychological research. Rats are very, very smart. Um, so they can be used for like behavioral studies, and then they're they're resilient animals. So they've been used in developing drugs, studying diseases, nutrition, aging, like just about anything. Rats are very, very common for research. Um, and then colored rats have been pretty well accepted as pets. Um, people don't really want a solid colored rat, like the black or brown rat, or even really the white rat because it looks like a rat you would find on the streets. Um, so people like the colored rats because they look different. They don't look like something you would necessarily see on the streets. So they've ended up making pretty good pets. Um, rats don't necessarily need a huge cage if they're by themselves. Um, but I mean, I found that rats are very, they're active animals. And if you're not going to take them out of the cage to let them be active, then they're going to need a big cage to be active in. Um, just like all the other animals, it needs to be gnaw proof because they're going to chew on it. They chew on everything. They're going to chew on the cage. So the cage does need to be gnaw proof. And their feed bowl needs to be, whoops, their feed bowl needs to be clean. It should probably be ceramic. So heavy kind of pottery. You don't really want it to be plastic because it can get gross. They can chew on it. It's not super easy to clean and it's easy for them to flip it over. If you give them a ceramic food bowl, it's easy to clean. It's not going to rust or get gross. They're not really going to be able to chew on it and it's going to be heavy enough that it's hard for them to tip it over. Um, ropes and ladders are good exercise for them so they can climb all around. They like to jump. They like to play. Um, and they like paper tissue for nesting, so like shredded papers. And they like bedding as like wood chips. They're not, they're not super picky. I'm not going to say that they prefer one, da 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 da. They're not picky. Most animals aren't super picky about what kind of bedding you're using for them. When you feed your rat, um, you can feed them rat food. I have rat food at school for them. Or you can feed them, they can feed, they can eat just about anything. Honestly, they're rats. Um, as much as I love the rats, they're rats and they'll eat about anything that you give them. Um, so that can be durable food, it can be dog food, fruits and vegetables as snacks, but again, you don't really want them to get diarrhea. Um, and they don't drink necessarily a ton of water. So mice. Um, I think this is our last one that we're going to go over. Mice, um, we talk about their breeds or their groups. Um, the first one up is the self color, meaning they are one solid color. They're the color of themselves. There's no pattern, no mixing of color, self color. They're white or they're brown or they're red or they're black. They're one color. You can have the tan mouse, 
Um, the tan is because they can be any color on the top, but they have to have a tan belly. So it could be white on the top with a tan belly, black on the top with a tan belly. Um, the tan belly is where you get the name because the tan belly is what they have in common. Peabald mice or um, I say peabald, you can say piebald. Doesn't really matter. Um, peabald or piebald or the pied mark mice meaning they have spots, patches, they have some kind of color pattern um, over top white. Typically they're gonna be white with some other color patched or spotted on. All three of these mice would be considered peabald or piebald. And then the satins, um, you can see in the picture, they look like very shiny, soft, um, it's a trait that's a bred into the mice for them to have this shiny, soft looking coat. If they didn't have the soft looking coat, if it wasn't shiny, then they would be self-colored. This would be, excuse me, a white self-colored, a red self-colored, a brown self-colored, a sand self-colored. But because they're shiny, they're satin mice and that's their breed. Diseases affecting mice, um, you can see them getting salmonella because if typically like it's going to be because their cages aren't kept clean. Um, you want to keep their cages clean, their water clean, their feed clean um, because they're going to go just about anywhere. If you give them a water bowl, they're probably going to go in their water bowl. If you don't clean out their food regularly, they're probably going to have gone in their food at some point. Um, and because they're eating everything from the food that's in their cage to the shavings in their cage, they're gonna end up coming in contact with it. Just about any of the pocket pets can get salmonella, but they have to be carrying it. Mice, they've been used for medical research, biological research, um, typically along the lines of hereditary studies, like seeing which genes are gonna be carried from which animal. Um, is this a, does this have to be a recessive trait? Like, if we breed these animals, like, what are we going to end up seeing? Because um, they're small, um, and their their genes are relatively easy to kind of control and manipulate. If they're kept clean, they're pretty they're relatively disease free. Um, if you handle them a lot, then they they make really good pets. The thing is, they're they're very 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 tiny. So you don't really want them to escape. They don't need a huge cage because of how tiny they are, um, but they do, they don't need a tall cage. Mice don't really have great eyesight. So what you don't want to end up happening is have like a two foot cage and their eyesight so bad that they fall two feet to the ground and get hurt. So if you're going to give them a bigger cage, you want it to be longer so that they have more to wander, but they're not really going to hurt themselves. Um, the bars do need to be like really close together so that they don't try to escape through. They don't try to gnaw through. Um, and wood shavings make a pretty good um, bedding for them. They can chew on it, they can nest in it, and because they're so small, they don't really smell terrible as long as you regularly clean their cage once, if not twice a week. Um, typically, mice will try to urinate in the corners of their cage. I say typically because there's, there's really no guarantee. Um, so if you use like a little bit of cat litter under their shavings or a little bit of baking soda, that will help try to absorb the smell so that you can go a little bit longer. And then water bowls don't work because they're gonna tip them over or someone's gonna end up going to the bathroom in it. So they need water bottles. I recommend all animals have water bottles so that they can drink out. When you feed them, um, the easiest thing you can do is just give them commercial food. You can do mouse food. Gerbil food works works pretty well. Gerbil food's kind of like a catch-all. 
Um, if you have an animal that doesn't have like specific dietary requirements, then durable food will work pretty well. Um, so animals like rats and mice, they don't have anything really specific that they need. So you can kind of feed them whatever. Um, and then mice won't overeat. Some animals will overeat. If they have the food, they're going to eat it all. Um, mice, for whatever reason, they will not overeat. A lot of animals, there's kind of like this trigger in their brain that says, hey, you're full, stop eating. Some animals, that trigger doesn't work too well. Um, in mice, though, that trigger works very well, and they say, hey, you're full, stop. And the mouse is like, okay, cool, I'm done. Let me know when I'm hungry again. Oh, boy. It was a B. <laughs> All right. So, what you guys are going to do is, oh, whoops, I guess I did not have it open. So, let me grab it real quick. Y'all are going to work on the pocket pets, diseases, um, the diagnosis and treatment. There's, I think, like eight or nine questions up there. Um, got a couple on rabbits, guinea pigs, which we haven't gotten to yet. Um, a couple on hamsters, so nine questions. So answer what you can. What you can't answer right now, we will end up covering, I think, tomorrow. Or next class, I guess I should say, not tomorrow. But let me know if you guys have any questions. Join me Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 o'clock for um, Zoom lunch. We can catch up. I miss you guys because it does look like I'm going to get to see y'all before the end of the year. So hop on Zoom and let me know what it is that I can help you guys with. Hopefully I'll see and hear from y'all soon. Bye, guys.